Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Trevor Bajori. I'm the director of the Water Quality Division for the Arizona Department of Environmental Quality. We have two other DEQ folks on with us, Len Drago, who uh, hopefully many of you recognize as our tribal liaison uh, and ombudsman from DEQ, as well as David Lells, a senior project manager in the Water Quality Division. And ultimately, the, uh, uh, the department appreciates I sincerely appreciate the opportunity to come talk to you uh, about this important topic. Uh, many of you might have heard me talking on these topics before, uh, but today we're going to talk about the Navigable Waters Protection Rule, which was a federal rule, and uh, how Arizona is looking to protect our state waters. Uh, again, thank you for the opportunity. The objective of today's meeting is to update you on what we're doing to implement the new federal rule and briefly describe a framework for what we're going to do uh, as a state moving forward. So uh, David, you're in control of the slides. If you'll please push the, uh, the next slide. So here's our agenda. I'll talk for a little bit about the Navigable Waters Protection Rule, uh, give a little bit of an update on what, you know, what, what we're tracking, what we're following. We'll talk about what Arizona has been doing and then talk about a potential direction for the protection of our state waters in Arizona. So I wanted to talk a little bit, many of you know that uh, in, on June 22nd of this year, the federal government changed the definition of waters of the United States, which, which changes the way the Clean Water Act applies to uh, water bodies throughout the nation, and particularly in Arizona. What the federal government did was that they changed, they shifted, in 2015, the then Obama administration uh, proposed a definition of waters of the United States in an attempt to clarify what was regulated under the Clean Water Act and what was not. When the current administration came in, they felt that the previous administration had gone the wrong direction and they decided to pursue uh, a path that was outlined in the Rapanos Supreme Court case uh, in particular, an opinion by Justice Scalia that said the Clean Water Act should really only regulate relatively permanent waters. And so what that means is that waterways like an ephemeral wash or a drainage would not be covered under the Clean Water Act and only those perennial and intermittent waters that, tran that, that uh, contribute flow during the course of a year would also be regulated. And so the reason that, um, that this is important is because the EPA and the Army Corps of Engineers knew that they were basing their regulations on commerce and navigation and that they would not be regulating all water bodies. And so from that perspective, they knew that there would be some unregulated waters that are important that the states would then have to protect and the states would have to regulate. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, as, the, as the presentation continues. Next slide, David. So the challenges with the new rule, um, uh, uncertainty seems to be the word of the day. Uh, there are components of the new rule that are just um, unclear uncertain, um, not ever, you know, there, there hasn't been federal tools and guidance to, to help states implement the new rule. Uh, there's, of course, an election coming up in two weeks that, you know, as, as administrations change, they like to undo what the previous administration does. So depending on the outcome of the election, there's uncertainty with where this uh, navigable waters protection rule will go. Uh, there are 11 court cases that we're tracking, two of those uh, related to Arizona, one the Navajo Nation and one, I believe, the Pascoyaki tribe, uh, which, which is challenging the Navigable Waters Protection Rule. And so ADEQ and Arizona are very much watching what happens uh, in those court decisions because that could impact how the, the rule is implemented in Arizona. When the rule was implemented, EPA and the Corps have been working on implementation tools to provide to the, the agencies that are required that, you know, to require to implement the changes to the rule. Uh, but those tools aren't yet complete. And so that provides some challenges for us as a department on knowing what waters we're still regulating under the Clean Water Act. Uh, we'll talk in just a minute about um, 
about what the state is doing, but what the, the new rule relies a lot upon flow regime. Does the water body flow all the time like a perennial water? Is it intermittent or is it ephemeral? And the department's you know, data on what's perennial, intermittent or ephemeral is simply incomplete. We don't have a comprehensive assessment of all water bodies across Arizona. In fact, we only have about 20% of our state um, that is uh, classified with regards to flow regime. Um, all, of, all of that said, the rules in effect, it is the law, and the department has the responsibility to ensure that the, the, the rule is implemented in Arizona. So with that, what have we been doing? David, if you'll move slide, thank you. Uh, we have been implementing the new rule to the best of our ability. We have created a toolkit for permittees and our own use to determine what's regulated and what's not. I'll highlight that it is a screening toolkit. It is not designed to give a definitive answer. It's really designed to give you an indication of whether you have a waters of the US discharge or not. Uh, I just mentioned the flow regime maps and we'll show those to you in a minute, but we're working on updating those flow regime maps and gathering as much data as we can to identify what waters are perennial and intermittent and which ones are still gonna be regulated under the Clean Water Act. And then ultimately we've been out uh, uh, talking to uh, many parties regarding the implementation of this rule. Uh, we've held nine stakeholder meetings, nine tribal listening sessions, uh, and seven stakeholder advisory group meetings, in addition to you know, meeting with individuals upon their requests. I will highlight that while we've held tribal listening sessions, we want to do official consultation as uh, tribal nations are interested in both the navigable waters protection rule and how we're implementing it and how the state should move forward uh, with regulation within our own state. Next map, or next slide, David. So this is, a, this is our map of flow regime of our water bodies. And you know, it's zoomed out on a state level, but you can see in blue, uh, those waters that are perennial within our state. Uh, green is intermittent and yellow is ephemeral. And then there's some that it's either not applicable because they're not official water bodies or the red, which is predominant, of course, on our map is what's undetermined at this point. We simply don't have data documenting the flow regime. You'll notice in the corner of, my, of our map that the data sources that we've used so far are data across a few of the different um, agencies within the state, as well as uh, the U of A and the United States Geologic Survey. We are absolutely interested if any of the tribal nations have data with regards to flow regime on any of the water bodies in Arizona. We would love to have that data to include in our comprehensive uh, assessment of the state. And this ultimately is something that we're gonna have to do continuously, right? We're gonna have to continuously uh, update our data because Flow regime can change over time. And so this is something that we need to know on, a, on a, a, a real time basis as much as possible because without flow regime, we cannot determine what's regulated under the Clean Water Act and what is not. And so we need assistance to help address the 80% gap of undetermined water bodies. Next slide. I mentioned a toolkit that we had put together. And again, I will highlight that it's a screening toolkit. So I wanted to show that to you briefly. And then ultimately, if, if any of the tribal nations are interested in a deeper conversation about this toolkit, we're happy to engage in that. But the question that this toolkit starts with is does a facility need a permit? And you can see that the first thing we do is we trace if there is a flow path using some different tracing tools that we'll show on the next slide to determine if the water can ever reach uh, a waters of the US or a nav traditional navigable water. And if it's not, if the water that, that we're tracing or if the discharge we're tracing is in a terminal basin or for other reasons doesn't ever reach a waters of the United States, no Clean Water Act permit would be required. And so that tracing tool, while not perfect, is the first screening level to determine whether a permit's required. If that trace that you do does show that you can reach a that there is a conveyance to a traditional navigable water or other waters of the United States, then you have to look to see if 
if there's perennial or intermittent flow between your discharge and where it reaches uh, that traditional navigable water. And if there is, if there is that uh, continuous perennial or intermittent flow, then you have to get a Clean Water Act permit. It's required because you are discharging to the waters of the US. If it's unknown, or if there are ephemeral components of that uh, flow path, there's some indicator parameters um, um, such as vegetative cover, continuous conveyance uh, uh, or a, a conveyance pathway, uh, or you know, do, do you have evidence that Google Earth documents that there's flow at some times, those kinds of things. And if that's the case, if, if it's the case that, that there are these risk factors, a permittee then decides whether, whether or not they need to get a permit because they're the ones liable if it's later proven that their discharge does reach a waters of the United States. Ultimately, it's EPA, ADEQ, and for purposes of the Clean Water Act Section 404 permitting, that's up to the permit. Or up to, if we, we get to make the final decision based on data that shows that there is a, a discharge to a waters of the United States. This is a, what we consider an interim tool until we get additional tools that we know EPA is working on to try to implement waters of the United States rule uh, in Arizona. So some of the, next slide, some of the, um, the tool, uh, the resources for the toolkit, uh, one is the USGS Streamflow Raindrop Tool. That tool is a water tracing tool where if you put a drop of water in one location, where does that go based on elevation? It's not a perfect tool, but it is a great tool with regards to tracing that flow. Flow regime and channelized conveyance is something that ADEQ is putting GIS maps together. Uh, those will be made public. I think uh, we're shooting for the end of this month to have our current flow regime map up to date. And then there's some other referenced ones that we're still working on uh, trying to make useful for this tool. But I, want, I wanted to mention this because I want everybody to be aware that the department is not just sitting back and waiting for EPA to do something. In fact, that's what many states are doing, but we're trying to give tools to both permittees, stakeholders, and ourselves to make sure that we're implementing the waters of the US rule as it was, as it was designed and intended and you know, we're trying to follow the law. Next slide. So I'm going to transition my conversation a little bit. So based on what I just told you, we have been trying to go through and assess our water bodies in Arizona and determine what is regulated in the state and what is not. And as we've done that, we have dis discovered that there are wet waters, right? Not, not dry waterways or, or uh, ephemeral washes. There are wet waters in Arizona that won't be protected. Um, uh, and we'll, we'll show you a couple of those in just a minute. We believe as an agency that when you have a good environment and a good economy, that those work in conjunction with each other. That if, if you have a good economy, the environment actually gets protected better because there's more resources to address environmental issues. A good, econ or a good environment attracts it, uh, business to the state, whether that's tourism or, uh, or companies who want their employees to have good quality of life, those things are supportive of each other. In fact, uh, the Audubon Society published a report uh, either last year or this year that's, that identified that waterways contribute $13.5 billion, billion dollars to the state economy. That's more than mining and that's more than golfing. Um, and so from that perspective, the economic value of having a quality environment is high. Um, and then finally, we'll, we'll talk a bit in a minute about having a state program will help fulfill Governor Ducey's vision and direction to the state. The, the, in case you haven't heard it, the governor's vision for our state is for Arizona to be the number one state to live, work, play, recreate, retire, visit, do business, and get an education. To be the number one state, we can't leave our state waters without protection. Um, and we believe that now is, a, is an opportunity for us to put into place a program that will help that. Uh, next slide, David, I'd like to give a couple of examples of waters that will no longer be protected by the Clean Water Act based on our assessment. A couple of these uh, will have 
uh, four examples for you today. Um, the Santa Fe Reservoir up near Williams. It's a popular recreation spot. It's also the drinking water source for the city of Williams. Uh, this particular water body has a impairment for mercury fish, mercury and fish tissue, which limits the amount of fish that, that should be consumed when you're out recreating and, and angling. Um, those standards would no longer apply from a Clean Water Act perspective and there would be no protection uh, for this water body. Another example, uh, Southern Arizona uh, is Roper Lake. It's a state park, very popular place. You can see uh, many lakes in Arizona, for some reason, you're not allowed to swim or things like that, but this is actually one where you can recreate and swim in the water and be in the water. Important to protect people who are interacting with the water. In fact, the public has an expectation that the waters that they're recreating in uh, are going to be protective of their health. Now, obviously, there's all kinds of water-related challenges uh, that, that you could get yourself into trouble with, but from a quality of the water, even if there is a problem, they expect to be told so that they can make appropriate decisions for their health. Next slide. Two more examples uh, based on our assessment. Watson Lake uh, in near the Prescott area, very popular recreation site. Uh, it is also not meeting Clean Water Act standards uh, based on if it was a Clean Water Act water body. Uh, and then Woods Canyon Lake near Payson, also a very popular, beautiful place uh, within the state. Uh, for people to go and recreate, especially during the summer to get out of the, the Phoenix heat or the Tucson heat. And those water bodies would no longer be protected under the Clean Water Act. Governor Ducey in 2017, as the EPA and the Army Corps of Engineers were pondering how to change the Clean Water Act uh, applicability, asked all 50 governors what their perspective was on Clean Water Act regulation. And you can see on the slide, this is Governor Ducey's response in regard to a reduced scope of the federal, regula of federal regulation under the Clean Water Act, Arizona recognizes and welcomes the need to protect non-waters of the US state surface waters. So our goal, our drive is to try to fulfill that direction from our governor, as I mentioned his vision earlier, um, to protect state waters. That, that is the direction that he gave us uh, when he commented to EPA. So that's our goal, that's our direction. Um, I mentioned earlier that we have had multiple stakeholder meetings, multiple tribal listening sessions, as well as uh, we've established a, a stakeholder advisory group. I wanna talk a little bit about what we've heard. Um, what we've heard is that a state program should keep what we know. We had uh, uh, floated the idea of a, of a radically different type of program, one that, was, one that was based on water quality impacts and water quality uses. Um, generally, people were not comfortable with that. They wanted to keep what they were familiar with. We heard that we need to have a map and a list of protected waters. In that, I hear the word clarity. People want clarity with regards to what's protected and what is not protected. And a list or a map of those waters is necessary to provide that clarity. We also heard from multiple people that we should build on our existing programs and authorities rather than perhaps creating uh, a new program. And so we have uh, we've taken all that feedback uh, and a little bit more that we've heard and try to uh, identify how we could move forward with a state program that meets those existing things. And so we've put together a draft framework. I do wanna highlight that, you know, we are from a tribal listening session perspective, we are uh, wanting to hear from, from the tribal nations, willing to consult. There has been a representative of the uh, Intertribal Council of Arizona as part of the stakeholder advisory group. So what we're about to present to you has been shared with the stakeholder advisory group and we've asked them for their input uh, by, by October 30th. And so we'll get into some next steps, but I want, I want to just tell you where we're at with what, we've, uh, what we're doing with the, new pro with the potential new program. So I want to talk, but before I talk about the new program, I want to be clear on what the current state is. This is what's happening right now in Arizona. If there is a Waters of the United States, 
there is a point source and stormwater permitting control program, right? There, there's a program in place to manage discharges to waters of the United States. We also set water quality standards. We can enforce those standards. Um, there's what's called total maximum daily load analyses done. This is where when an, a water body is not meeting those standards, the department goes through and identifies what are what's contributing to that uh, impairment and then can take steps to address those, those contributing sources. And then ultimately the, the dredge and fill permitting program uh, in Arizona is run by the Army Corps of Engineers uh, and has been since the inception of the program. Non-waters of the United States. Yes, there are some waters today um, even before the new rule that are not covered under the Clean Water Act. In those cases, there is no permit program. There is authority for the department to set water quality standards, but we've never done that. We've never set anything other than Clean Water Act standards. And, uh, but if we did set those standards, we could then enforce them. We don't have any of the total maximum data load or dredge and fill processes associated with, um, with current non-waters of the United States. So our proposed framework for, for moving forward is to add an, an additional row of waters that would receive protection within the state. So you can see the waters of the US will continue to maintain the same protections, listed non-waters of the US. So here's a, what we're proposing is to provide a list of waters in Arizona that would be protected uh, under the same framework, they wouldn't be subject to the Clean Water Act, but under the same framework that we use to protect our Clean Water Act waters. And so that would be, there would be a point source and stormwater protection program. We would propose to keep existing standards that apply on these water bodies. For many of them that were WOTUS and that now lo no longer are, there are, there are standards. We would then be able to enforce those standards uh, establish total maximum daily loads and control what's being discharged. We're not proposing a dredge and fill permitting program right now, mostly because the department does not have the infrastructure and the capability and the experience running uh, such a program. When we presented this to the stakeholder advisory group, some people had some alternative thoughts of things that we might be able to do to still protect water bodies against activities that, that could impact water quality that would be covered under dredge and fill program that, uh, that we are taking back and considering. And then any water that's not listed, that's not a waters of the US would stay in the current state where they would, we could set water quality standards and enforce those standards, but there wouldn't be any additional regulatory program. So getting a little bit deeper into what the listed waters would be, next slide, David. Trevor, there is an interruption in my internet right now. Hold on one second. All right, no problem. Trevor, I'm gonna remove the listed waters for a moment because they have glitched out. Okay, so let me let me just talk about it while you're trying to pull up your uh, your system. We propose that there would be what we call a protected waters, surface waters list. Of course, that you know, waters of the United States will be continually protected under this or under the program because they're still subject to the Clean Water Act. We propose that Arizona's eight major rivers continue to be protected, uh, regardless of whether you know some parts of them at least are going to be waters of the United States but having them listed as part of this protected waters list just ensures that there's no question, uh, especially since the new rule has this, uh, a couple com more complex pieces of typical year um, uh, and ephemeral breaks, we would propose that all eight major rivers would be protected. And when I say eight major rivers, because you can't see my slide, um, that's the uh, Bill Williams River, the Gila River, Colorado River, the Little Colorado River, um, uh, Salt River, San Pedro, Santa Cruz, and the Verde Rivers. We would propose that all of those water bodies, even if parts of them from a flow perspective are ephemeral or not, all of those would be, continue to be protected. And just, just to provide clarity, 
even though they're some of them may be waters of the U.S. still. Plus additional wet waters like the ones we showed you, Roper Lake, Santa Fe Reservoir, waters that we would list that clearly should continue to be protected. David, is the next slide working? Let's hope so. Bravo. All right, so here is a map of those eight major rivers. We wanted to show them to you so that you could see what eight major rivers would just be on the protected waters list. And you can see in green that the green water bodies are either perennial or intermittent. Uh, you know, wh whether they're Clean Water Act regulated or not, that's not the intent of, of the map. Many of them will be, uh, but those waters would be protected. You can see in red, the ephemeral waters, so the segments that are ephemeral, and then in gray are the ones that are undetermined. We just don't have enough data to determine if they're perennial, intermittent, or ephemeral. And so our proposal is that all eight of these would continue to be protected. So what, uh, next slide please, David. Uh, as far as additional wet waters, our proposal, which you know is, is not fully uh, ready yet, is that we would have an initial list of protected waters. And that initial list of protected waters uh, would be, is, is something that we've asked for comment from the stakeholder advisory group to get an understanding of what's our starting point. And then we would define criteria and a public process when we need to add or subtract waters from that list based on the fact that that flow regime is dynamic and can change over time. And so the permitting, the standards, the TMDLs, all of those pieces of the framework would only apply to waters of the United States, of course, and waters that are on this list of protected waters. Um, again, there would need to be, as I mentioned, the criteria and public process. I, I presume that, that you know, there are waters that may not be on the initial list that either tribal nations or others are concerned about that they could petition to be on the list and ultimately, we would need the criteria to determine what's appropriate to add and what's not, uh, what should not be on that list. So that's where we are. Uh, David, if you can go to the next slide. We have, uh, you know, as I mentioned, hopefully multiple times during this, this discussion, we are absolutely willing to come consult with any of the tribal nations that are interested in consulting with us. We will... Um, uh, we would be happy to do that, whether that's in person with the appropriate uh, precautions for personal protection in place or from a remote meeting perspective. Uh, remote meetings, while maybe not as intimate and, and it's good to see people in person, do make joining meetings such as this one uh, easier for more people. We are going to continue over the next year to update our flow regime maps, both from a collection of our own data and looking for other data sources associated with, data, with water flow. And so again, as I mentioned, if any of the tribal nations have such data, we'd be very interested in it. As far as the state surface water program goes, we've asked for input from our stakeholder advisory group by October 30th. We expect to have a tribal listening session on that proposal in early November. And then we would also hold a stakeholder meeting for any interested stakeholder also early November. Uh, if we are going to pursue legislation, which this proposal would require a change to state statute, that will need to be, you know, we'll need to negotiate that language over the next couple months before the session begins in January. And so uh, ultimately that, that's our path forward right now. And uh, um, um, it's gonna be tight, right? It's gonna be tight to be able to try to get all of that done between now and January. And Kelly, as the facilitator, that's my last slide. I am happy to answer or take any questions and do my best to give an answer. Or if necessary, we can uh, take the comment and get back to whoever the commenter was uh, if we need to do a little bit of research on that question. So again, thank you for taking the time to listen and let me present on this topic. Uh, Kelly, I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you, Trevor. Um, I just see one question that's come in. I'll just read it out to you. Um, Ronnie asks, are there any TMDLs identified by ADEQ along any of the major eight rivers? Um, so I can't list it off the top of my head. I don't know if uh, 
David Lels can pull that up while I while I give some preliminary answers. Though um, a TMDL is required when a water body is impaired, and so uh, some of our water bodies that are some of those eight major rivers are impaired. Whether ADEQ has completed a TMDL for those areas or not, I'll, I'll rely on either David or Ronnie. We'll have to get back to you. You know, the Colorado River has a salinity issue, as many people know. Um, I'm not, I don't have it committed to memory what other impairments there might be along those eight major rivers. David, any, any uh, chance that you'll be able to pull that up? Uh, actually, I've dropped into your chat the Watershed Plans and TMDLs website. It looks like there's TMDL um, uh, uh, status updates for all of our watersheds on the right-hand side. But it might take some time to get through all of them. Yeah, okay. So, so Ronnie, if you're interested, if you want to uh, reach out to David, he can coordinate some con a conversation between me and my staff and, and you and your staff as needed to try to answer that specific question. Great, thank you, David. It might also be helpful to just drop that link, if that's possible, into the chat for everyone to see. Um, I will do that's that, great. that's awesome. Thank you. Um, you have yeah. one more, sorry, go ahead. Uh, I was reading the chat, I think that was the other comment. Oh uh, yeah. So if I, may just, if I may just chime in for Lisa. I've been with the department for almost 20 years now and maybe it shouldn't have been such a hard learned lesson, but it was a hard learned lesson for us to recognize, you know, um, I think we always considered tribal nations as stakeholders, but, but there's a difference, right? There's a, an intergovernmental relationship with a, an independent nation. And so, yes, we've, we've learned and do our best to not just consider tribes uh, as stakeholders. Um, and actually, I, I think we typically meet with tribes first before we meet with the stakeholders, and there's no particular rhyme or reason uh, other than that's just typically how it falls through. Uh, but ultimately, yes, we, we recognize that, that tribal nations are, uh, are not just your typical stakeholder, and, and we want to make sure that we're building that relationship by having those separate conversations because they're separate interests. <laughs> you can hope, Lisa. Her comment is one day EPA might get there too. You can hope. Um, uh, it, it has definitely been a journey. Uh, um, I won't give you the details of my entire journey, but ultimately, uh, yeah, I mean, it's building relationships with each other and learning how to coordinate and work with each other. So um, David put his presentation or his present, his email uh, into the chat. So if anybody would either like to have consultation or even if it's not official consultation with tribal leadership, if there are specific topics that you're interested in discussing with us directly that might be of most interest to you, uh, we're happy to have those conversations and are willing to commit to our, our time to doing that. I'm not seeing any more questions in the chat box. If anyone would like to unmute themselves and uh, ask any questions or any comments at this time, that'd be great. I saw how many people were here today. I can't believe that there's no questions other than the couple that we've, uh, we've received. <laughs> uh, Trevor, uh, this is Will, can you hear me? I can, yes, Will, please go ahead. Uh, what was your time frame again where you're looking at um complete your uh, tribal consultation? Do you have a time frame that you're wanting to complete that by if people do have, I uh, want to take advantage of that? So I, I don't have a specific time frame in mind, but just consider what the time frames are on trying to move forward on this program, right? So the um, legislation will have to be due, uh, you know, have to be in the legislature at least by January uh, because that's when all bills are dropped and bills are heard. And yes, there's some finagling that can happen during the course of the session, but our goal would be to be transparent and, and let everybody know what our, what our proposal is. And then during the session, of course, uh, so, so either before session, we're happy to consult with tribal leadership or during the session. And then uh, let, let's go on the optimistic path of, hey, our bill gets approved pretty quick in March. Typically, the, the bills are not 
uh, don't apply or don't, don't take effect until 90 or 60 or 90 days after the session ends, which is typically the end, you know, like August timeframe, there might be some exceptions for us to be able to get that in. But, but then that's when our program would take effect. So we're willing to consult all during that process. And even after the program has taken effect to consult with tribal nations, if, if the tribal nations are interested. Yeah, I mean, the, we, we've dealt with the, obviously during this time with the different, um, but like ADOT. Okay. And, um, looking at doing some projects within the community on the I-10 and certain and other, a couple other flip uh, away projects that we have going on. Okay. And so um, with the community having the uh, 401 certification authority, um, we're working with uh, the Army Corps. We're going to be working with the Army Corps in consultation to take advantage of that, of understanding their changes that they're proposing and seeing if um, our water quality program wants to uh, approve any nationwide permits going forward. And so uh, obviously determining, um, ensuring that we all understand um, how it's going to be dealt with in the community and how that's going to translate over to a, a year side uh, we want to make sure that that's consistency there. Yeah, we'd be happy to meet and talk specifically about those projects if if that's what uh, the tribal nation's interested in. I mean, what I presented, of course, was all about what we're doing with regards to the federal rule and what the state program might look like. Uh, but if you have projects in front of you now that we need to converse about, we're happy to do that. All right, thank you. And Kelly, I'm just going to, I'm going to read the chat if that's okay. Uh, that's totally fine. <laughs> Josephine asked, will the non-WOTUS programs be funded by the state? So the, one of the reasons that we have proposed this framework is because what it does is allows us to leverage our existing funding program uh, to, to help do this work. So let me, let me explain. Our current structure for the Clean Water Act permitting program is a pay for service model where permittees get billed when they apply for a permit and then they pay an annual rate to be able to, uh, you know, to pay for our, our responsibilities of monitoring, uh, our responsibilities of compliance and enforcement, those kinds of things. And so by changing the definition to include this protected list of state waters, the funding will continue to go into the, the state, you know, into the fund that we have that we can continue to use for those activities. So it fits nicely within our existing framework and structure. Having said that, we do get EPA funding to do both monitoring and assessment and also to, uh, to do some on the ground projects for improving water bodies. Our conversations with EPA is that that funding would still be available for our state program. So we'll have the ability to continue to balance our state funding and the federal funding to continue protecting Arizona's waters. Um, I see Lisa Gover had a question. What happens to those flows? Uh, if, for example, whatever, maybe a mining waste flow that are discharged to land or even into a non-WOTUS waterway, but don't land in WOTUS or your listed waters, how will those flows be regulated? So you're getting into some of the complexities that we try to deal with, right? The Clean Water Act regulates water body or uh, pollutant discharges. So it's not just flow, like it doesn't have to be wet water that goes into another waters of the US. If I'm discharged, let's say I, uh, for some reason, need to dispose of 100 tons of dirt and rock. I can't just put that into a water body uh, because I require a Clean Water Act, right? I'd have to get permitted. But if I put it upstream in an ephemeral wash and when it rains, all of that pollution gets into the water body, I still have Clean Water Act liability. So there is uh, uh, some of the complexity associated with the Clean Water Act that it's not just about water discharges to water, it's about pollution discharges to water. And even if it happens over time, and that would continue under the Clean Water Act WOTUS. Under our state waters protected list, we're proposing the same thing. If the pollution will reach a WOTUS or our protected water, then you would still have to get your permit uh, to minimize or eliminate that discharge. 
uh, as well as if, you know, if it's impairing it, you might have to clean it all up, those kinds of things if it's in the past. For waters that aren't protected, um, let me just give an example of something right now that, that's on the fence, like it's not clear of whether it'll be protected or not, is an urban lake. Um, I'm, from, I'm from Avondale. Let's say the city of Avondale has a lake that they've built in one of their uh, you know, uh, parks or areas that people may chase the ducks around or may fish in. Those water bodies, we're not sure whether they'd be protected under our list, probably not at this point. If there's a discharge or, or some other issue with those lakes, it would be the landowner, the lake owner that would then have to address that and deal with it under their own authorities rather than the department trying to step in and say that those water bodies need to be protected. So there's other, other avenues for that protection, I guess is what I'm suggesting, than just uh, a, a Clean Water Act type regulation. Um, a, a, a nuisance type suit uh, could be one way, right? Through a, 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 a person's ability to, to sue or it could be simply the city or whoever owns that property and is allowing other people to interact with it. They may want to make sure that their water is clean and protected as well because they want people to come recreate there also. So there'd be like you, you suggested as far as a lawsuit, there's probably more than one avenue to make sure that that water is protected and cleaned up as needed. One interesting thing I'll just add, um, Many of these water bodies, like again, Avondale having a city park or Mesa and Kiwanis Park, there's not people proposing to discharge to those locations. They're not, they're not sites where uh, industry or anything like that may discharge. Their challenges are more of when it rains, they might get fertilizer from the grass that's upstream or they might get pesticides or those kinds of things. And so uh, it'd be up to them to manage how those waters are protected. Great question though, Lisa, so thank you. Do we have any other questions? I'd be happy to answer uh, any other topics. Uh, it doesn't have to be Clean Water Act. Uh, it can be drinking water or anything else that you guys would like to ask about. Trevor, this is David. I could drop the information about our um screening tool in the chat so people could check it out. Uh, you mean our website? Yes, indeed. Yes, that would be great. If people are interested in a little bit more detail on the screening tool, David will provide the website for you to go look at it. Um, I, I will just highlight one thing that uh, while it's a screening tool, we've talked to EPA and shared it with EPA because one, we want to make sure that they know what we're doing, but they're actually sharing it uh, with others because they're unaware of, unaware of any other state that is taking this level of action to try to understand the Clean Water Act and make sure that things are protected. Um, looks like Ronnie had a question, are CAFOs permitted by ADEQ? Uh, let me get a drink of water and I'll answer that. Um, Ronnie, I'm assuming you're asking from a <laughs> water quality perspective because there is air quality regulation of CAFOs as well. But from a water quality perspective, is it depends. Many CAFOs fall under a general permit that we have for our APP groundwater program. So we have a state level groundwater program. Many of those CAFOs don't discharge to a waters of the US. And so therefore they're subject to the APP program. And there's a specific permit that they're required to get or to, to, to comply with, uh, with regards to the APP program and managing their discharge to groundwater. The only, we only have one CAFO in the state that has a, a Clean Water Act permit and that's down near the Yuma area. They're a very large facility. They don't actually discharge on a regular basis, but because they feel they have the potential to discharge or they're close to, uh, uh, it's actually, I think one of the canals in the area they decided they wanted to get a Clean Water Act permit. And so they've held that permit for many years uh, just to be sure that they're making, uh, taking care of the environment and protecting the water bodies that are around them. Uh, but other than that, there's, there's not uh, in Arizona that I'm aware of any other CAFOs that discharge to a waters of the United States. 
uh, Lisa, you asked, is the reason that lakes that I mentioned, like the Avondale Lakes or uh, Kiwanis Park, is because they're unnatural or man-made features? And the answer is yes. A man-made feature within a waters of the United States. So I'm going to use the Salt River, for example. For those of you familiar with Tempe, Tempe created a lake in the middle of the Salt River called Tempe Town Lake. Because it's in the middle of a, of a water body that is a waters of the United States, and, and, and I'll argue that it is still a waters of the United States, even though, uh, you know, the new rule came out. Because that water body is in the middle, it is still considered a waters of the United States. So Tempe Town Lake still would be protected under the Clean Water Act. With a water body like Kiwanis Park or, or Avondale Lakes, there's no, uh, there's no impact to any waters of the United States. They're wholly contained, right? So if you create a lake that has a discharge that goes to waters of the U.S., then yeah, you have to regulate that lake. Uh, but so because it's man-made outside of a normal uh, natural waterway and because the water doesn't discharge anywhere, then it is not regulated. Think of it as it's essentially a big swimming pool, right? They may not chlorinate it. They may stock it with fish, but but the water's not going anywhere. In fact, they have to keep adding water to maintain the right level of water in that feature. All right, are there, are there any other questions? I'm happy to, uh, to try to address any other questions that you might have. Um, okay. Uh, uh, Theodore asked, please discuss the outcome of the Tempe Town Lake rail crash this summer. So I don't, um, that while that was a discharge to a water of the U.S., it was not led by my division, meaning we have an emergency response program that's actually out of our waste programs division. So I can talk high level about it, but I can't talk the details. Um, essentially, you know, there, there was rail crash, the, the, the bridge caught fire. Um, some rail cars crashed into, not into Tempe Town Lake is my understanding, but next to Tempe Town Lake and there was some spill to the lake. ADQ, the city uh, and others were out there monitoring, collecting samples. There was cleanup processes done by the owner of the rail line, I believe Union Pacific. We monitored uh, specifically for compounds that were in those, the, the rail cars, cyclohexanone, I believe, uh, both upstream and downstream. And, and yes, there was some detected uh, natural attenuation in the cleanup of that uh, helped resolve that issue. Uh, to my understanding, the, the lake, it, it does not show any effects from that spill. Uh, during that spill, there were some identification of other pollutants of concern that are not currently regulated, particularly perfluorinated alkyl substances or PFAS. Um, and so ag the agencies are continuing to, to track and watch those issues. Um, but they are not, uh, but as far as I know, the outcome of that crash has not had any catastrophic or significant impact to, to Tempe Town Lake. Um, obviously, we, th th those aren't the kind of things we want to do or, or want to have happen. Uh, and we, we want them cleaned up when they, act, when they unfortunately do happen. Um, another question, will the tribes be required to use the state's non-WOTUS regulations? How can tribes enforce their own non-WOTUS anti-degradation standards? So the answer uh, for that question is no. There is no requirement for the states. Our state statute that we're working on, uh, you know, the revision that would need to occur would not apply on the tribal nations. It may apply to waters that are off nation, off the nations that are still important to you. Uh, but it would not apply within your reservations. Um, uh, the way our current thinking is going right now is that anti-degradation would still apply in the same way that it does to Clean Water Act discharges to the waters that we're proposing would be protected. Um, and so, uh, you know, obviously as, as permittees want to discharge or if there's documentation that there's de anti-degradation then the tribes could look at that data and opine but the tribes on your own nation um, you have the same authority as the state does from the perspective of if you want to set your own standards within your nation I mean, you know that's within the leadership of your tribal nations to do um, so josephine if that doesn't answer your question can you help me understand a little bit more what you're asking
Um, so, so what I'm asking is that if, if a tribe already has some anti-degradation standards on waters that are not polluted, okay. and they are going to be um, called non-WOTUS waters, and um, there's like proposed discharge into those waters, will the tribe be, how will the tribe be able to enforce their anti-degradation standards if they don't have um, any EPA support for that because they're not waters of the United States. And, and so your question is about waters that are on the tribal nations? Yes. Okay. And maybe adjacent to um, some, you know, some other waters, like, I can't think of one now. Okay. Um, but, <laughs> but, but in theory, I think I get what you're asking is, uh, if the Clean Water Act on the tribal nation, if the Clean Water Act requirements for anti-degradation or whatever requirements or standards, if those go away, it really is then up to the tribe to decide how they want to protect those waters. And that's that's what we're really talking about, right? The rule is in place. The federal government has changed the rule. And yes, there's some lawsuits. Yes, there's an election. But absent uh, a change at the court or federal level, it's really up to the tribe to decide how they want to protect their waters. And it's the same for Arizona. And, you know, ultimately what, what EPA and the reason, one of the reasons I think Governor Ducey has supported this change at the federal level is because it does, it doesn't, it, it, the, the, the new rule is not about what waters should be protected. The new rule is about what waters are going to be protected by the federal government. And then the state or tribe can then decide what they want to do to protect their own waters, recognizing, so I fully recognize that what that means is that state and tribal resources then have to go into that protection, not federal resources. And so I recognize that there may be a resource constraint that tribes and state may not have the money or expertise to regulate those waters. And that's, that's a challenge we'll have to work through to get over. But um, back to your uh -huh. question, what, so, once the Clean so Water it, Act is no it, longer protecting that water, anti-degradation just simply doesn't apply anymore. The tribe would need to come up with its own program to protect those waters. Okay, yeah. So it, it just sounds like um, some, of the, some of the waters that the tribes have already been protecting and have already um, generated the documentation to provide the use of that water, that they won't be funded to um, protect them anymore. And there's no option. Uh, um, ultimately, you are right that we have come to rely on the federal government to provide resources and the structure to protect the waters. And in some cases that's going away and it's then on the state or tribe to determine how best to regulate those waters, right? I mean, the tribe may have uh, the desire to apply the exact same approach that the Clean Water Act does. That would be within your tribal uh, authority, but the resources to do that would have to come from the tribe instead of the federal government. That's what I was wondering about, what that, okay. Thank you, that's, that's the answer to my question. Okay, great, you're welcome. And it concerning too. <laughs> yes, I understand. So please, I, I'm in the exact same situation where, man, I really, my program really needs some additional funding to try to take on some of these waters that are no longer going to be protected by the Clean Water Act. That was one of the concerns with the first proposal that we came out with was that it was a brand new program, it was different, and we needed a funding source. And so with our revised proposal, it, we're trying to use existing structure, existing uh, experience and, and fit in the waters that we feel should be protected in a way that doesn't create those same problems. Uh, but it'll still be challenging for us as we learn how to manage our own waters. Yeah, yeah. Well, you have a tax. You, you have <laughs> people that you collect taxes from that I mean, this not you, but I mean, the state of Arizona can collect uh, taxes from citizens. And I don't, I mean, tribes aren't really in that position. Um, 
not to go too deep into the state funding, but ADEQ receives very little, what's called general fund money, right? Like uh, uh, income tax type money. We, we have what's called a, 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 a fee for service model where we're charging the people who use our services fees to pay for our program. So um, while well, yes, the state collects, collects tax money, the department doesn't get very much of that. And my program specifically doesn't get any. Right. So like maybe like the like people who go to Watson Lake, you know, you can redirect or just charge them a double or something. It's a great but, idea, Josephine. I may have to try that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It'd be nice if the, you know, if tribes could do something like that also to generate money from, you know, people using using the 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 ecosystem services and you know, filter that into the um, funding for the program for the people that they need to hire to um, enforce their anti-degradation standards. Yeah. And again, that, that's a tribal leadership because each tribe is going to be a little bit different with regards to how they want to protect their waters and what waters they have on their nations to protect. Yeah. It's a, like they have to, everybody would have to hire a whole entire person to you know, be the police, though, which is a which is a huge issue that this is creating. Yep, I, I, I fully recognize it. Yes, thank you. That's all. You answered my question. Thank you very much. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Josephine. Are there any other questions? We have a couple minutes left. If there's any other questions that someone asked, otherwise, Kelly, I'll, I'll turn the meeting back over to you. Great. I haven't seen any come in, um, and if. We can do one last call if anyone wants to unmute themselves and ask a question. We can give them a minute or so to do that. Um, and if not, we can we can just end a couple minutes early. Presentation okay. was great. Good job, Trevor, and thanks for the help, David. Great again. Uh, th thank you for your time. I appreciate the interest, uh, and I will just reiterate: we are we are willing to come talk to each tribal nation independently. Uh, and re recognizing that uh, each situation is different. So if there's additional questions or issues you have, David put his email in the chat, please take that down or, or go visit our website. You can find our contact information pretty easy. So again, thank you for your time today. Okay, thank you everyone. Yeah, thank you.